We begin tonight with the death sentence for a gang member who killed a high school football player because he carried a red backpack. The murder of Jamil Shaw shocked the community. Eyewitness News reporter Miriam Hernandez is live in downtown L.A. with the family's reaction to the judge's decision. Miriam? From the night of the crime to the sentencing of the killer, it has been a four-year ordeal for the Shaw family. Today was the wrenching finale. Already convicted of murder, Pedro Espinosa today heard directly from the family of Jamil Shaw II, the 17-year-old he gunned down. The days when I was growing up, it was basically, you use your fists. You don't just go and kill somebody cold blood. Um, it's the coward's way out. Jamil was a football standout who Espinosa shot, thinking Jamil was a rival gang member. Before the judge pronounced the death penalty, the Shaw family told of their pain. After four years, still raw. I find myself, I'm not that strong of a Christian because I can't turn around and say, I forgive you for killing my son. You should thank God if you have your family intact and your kids and you're loving them and you're doing things. Thank God for that because there's people like that don't give a damn. Espinosa, 23, an undocumented immigrant, had a history of gang crime and assaults even while behind bars. He shot Jamil Shaw a day after he had been released from jail. Today, in a last-ditch effort to avoid sentencing, Espinosa demanded a new trial, telling the judge his attorney was incompetent. The motion was denied. Instead, Judge Ronald Rose ordered execution. At which time and place you shall then put to death Pedro Espinosa in the manner prescribed by law. You know, you want revenge. You can't help it. It's like a human nature. That was my son that, you know, was on the streets dead. That was my son, and people don't understand that. And the family has these words for Jamil. We did it, man. We did all we could do, mm -hmm. you know. Can't, can't do no more than that, man, you know. In carefully weighing the aggravating factors that were established by the state beyond a reasonable doubt against the mitigating factors established by the defense, it is not simply a quantitative analysis, but is a qualitative one. It is this court's duty to look both the quality and the nature of the aggravating and mitigating circumstances which have been established. Under such an analysis and upon reflection and consideration, the, pro the proven aggravating factors substantially outweigh the, no the mitigating statutory and non-statutory mitigating factors. Therefore, Arise Alfonso Tisdale as to count one of the indictment, first degree murder of a law enforcement officer with a firearm and the lawful execution of his legal duties. It is the sentence of this court and the judgment of the law that you be sentenced to death for the first degree murder of Sergeant Gary Morales. I hate for any family to go through such pain and suffering as this. Speaking to the jurors who will decide whether he lives or dies, Austin Myers asked them to spare his life for his family. If you choose for me to die, it's only going to cause more pain and suffering for another family. Not me. It won't hurt me. I won't feel anything. It's going to hurt more innocent people. Last week, the jury found Myers guilty of aggravated murder. Prosecutors say Myers and co-defendant Tim Mosley hatched a plan to burglarize and kill Justin, then carried it out inside the Navy recruit's home in Wayne Township. They choked him, stabbed him 21 times, dumped his body in Preble County, and then fired two rounds into it. No, I've made a horrible mistake. Uh, I'm only 19 years old. I, I think there's a lot of good things I can do with my life if you allow me to keep my life. Judge Don Oda upheld the jury's recommendation and sentenced Myers to death. The defendant does not understand how precious life is. After sentencing, prosecutor David Fornshell revealed more details about Myers' plan, one that Fornshell says included killing more people. According to Tim Mosley, he said he wanted to go get his gun out of pawn in Dayton and use that gun as well as the one they stole from Mark Cates to go kill his own mom and stepdad. Austin Myers wanted to kill his own mom and stepdad after killing Justin Back. Just 15 minutes later, this is part of his plan.
this noon, a convicted killer is facing the death penalty. A Hillsborough County judge sentenced Dante Morris to lethal injection for the cold-blooded murders of two Tampa police officers. We showed you that moment live on ABC Action News Now. Our Laura Harris was in the courtroom when that sentence was handed down. She joins us now from the Hillsborough County Courthouse. Good afternoon, Laura. And Dia, you could hear a pin drop in the courtroom. Uh, the bailiff actually told everyone in there he didn't want to hear any type of emotion out loud when the judge handed down his sentence. And I can tell you, once he said Dante Morris was sentenced to death, they couldn't say anything out loud. Nobody could scream, nothing like that. But you saw tears rolling from family members' face. They were clutching each other's hands so tightly. I even saw one lady holding a picture of one of those officers as they listened to what the fate was of the man who murdered their family members. That's account one for the first degree premeditated murder of David Curtis. The court imposes a sentence of death. As to count two for the first degree premeditated murder of Jeffrey Kokab, the court imposes a sentence of death. And with this noon, all new this noon, a man who admitted to murdering two people and trying to kill another during an 08 robbery in St. Pete will learn his fate today. A Rob Munoz live in Clearwater this afternoon with the latest on this future, the sentencing hearing. Rob, what do you know? Well, we just came out of the courtroom maybe about a half hour ago, and Qaddafi Mullins was given the death penalty here by the judge. The judge said, based on all the factors in this crime, he said, and I quote, under Florida law, the defendant has forfeited his right to live. Now, Qaddafi Mullins sat in court sometimes smiling, other times looking down, as Judge Philip Federico ran through the events of August 2008. Mullins pled guilty and waived his right to a jury trial, so the decision of a life in prison sentence or the death penalty came down to the judge today. Mullins and an accomplice went to the Central Food Mart in St. Pete and during a robbery shot and killed the owner and another customer, then shot another customer, but that final customer lived. The violent crime was caught on surveillance camera, and that played a huge part in the sentencing today. That Dylan Roof deserves to die for the murders of nine black parishioners at the Mother Emanuel Church in June of 2015. You'll recall that uh, Roof uh, had plotted this uh, attack for six months. Uh, the government put on a, uh, a, a very convincing case tracking how Roof bought the gun, went into the church, was seen leaving with the gun, and also made a big, uh, a big a point of pointing out to the jury in closing arguments this morning that even now, 17 months after that attack, Roof continues to show no remorse. Roof was acting as his own lawyer. At one point today, he said, to, to, he told the jury uh, himself in his closing statement, which lasted only five minutes, uh, I felt like then, I felt like I had to do it. I still feel like I had to do it. Again, no remorse whatsoever. So the verdict again, death. A death sentence given down by this jury in Charleston, South Carolina, Dylan Roof, for the massacre at Mother Emanuel Church in June of 2015. Amelia Carr is behind bars now, and she'll die behind bars, just sentenced to death for kidnapping and murder. She tells me, after all that, it's a mistake. She says she's innocent. I'm terrified. I really am. A judge just told Amelia Carr her role in the murder of Heather Strong will cost her her life. Prosecutors painted the killing as a rocky love triangle. Carr was dating Strong's estranged husband, Joshua Fulgham. Investigators say the couple lured Strong to Carr's home, dragged her into a storage shed, duct taped her to a chair, put a plastic bag over her head, and suffocated her. Detectives say Carr confessed to the crime. Carr tells me she had an alibi. So you're saying you were not there when Heather was murdered? No, I wasn't. Why did the jury convict you? That's a good question. Investigators found Strong buried in a shallow grave more than a month after she was reported missing. You didn't strangle her? No. Did you have anything to do with burying her? No. I cared about her. Then why the confession? Carr says it was made up. She thought it would help her regain custody of her kids. Then I get sentenced to death row. Because I told a lie. Because I wanted my kids back.
Thank you, Peter. New developments tonight. Mobile County now has its first woman death row inmate. A Mobile judge today agreed with a jury's recommendation and sentenced Heather Lavelle Keaton to die by lethal injection. Keaton was convicted of the torture deaths of her two stepchildren, Natalie and Jonathan Chase DeBlace, five years ago. News 5's Jacqueline Quinn was in the courtroom today when the sentence was read. The sentencing hearing wrapped up an emotional case for the family members of the two young victims. Just remember the, the sweet personality and the loving nature. The two little angels. That's how we want to remember them. Prosecutors say Natalie and Jonathan DeBlaze had their lives cut short because they were murdered by unimaginable things to children. I mean, duct tape, uh, broomsticks, uh, lo uh, locked in, in suitcases and in closets in the dark, alone, afraid, tortured, starved, um, poisoned, dehydrated. It wasn't really a big surprise, but yet it was still no less emotional up in that courtroom as the judge sentenced Brad and Bradley to die. For this crime, the court sentences you to be put to death in the manner prescribed by law. Brandon Bradley appeared resigned to his fate as Judge Morgan Reinman sentenced him to death for the March 2012 murder of Brevard County deputy, wife, mother, and grandmother, Barbara Pill. The defendant murdered Deputy Pill in a selfish, foolish, and futile attempt to avoid returning to prison for violating his probation. More than two dozen uniformed deputies and non uniformed co workers packed the small courtroom and listened as Bradley apologized to Pill's friends and family. Bradley's family sobbed inside the courtroom and out, angry that his former girlfriend and co-defendant, who was with him at the time Pill was shot, was allowed to take a plea and receive a much lighter sentence. Pill's husband said her family is ready to move on with their lives. Bargo sat stoic in the courtroom. You, Michael Shane Bargo, are sentenced to death. He didn't even flinch when the judge sentenced him to death for the 2011 murder of 15-year-old Seth Jackson. Investigators say Bargo and four others lured Jackson to a home, beat him, shot him to death, burned and dismembered his body, then dumped the remains, all because of a dispute over a girl. The judge called it the most cold and calculated murder he's ever seen. The death penalty is not only justified, it is the only appropriate sentence based on the evidence and the law of the state of Florida. Seth Jackson's family decided not to go to court today. Bargo's grandmother broke down crying and his family didn't want to talk as they left court. But his attorney pointed blame at Jackson, saying he was a violent person who made plenty of threats. To burn their house down, to rape them, to shoot them. Jurors didn't get to hear about that, and she believes it will be part of his automatic appeal to the state Supreme Court. She also feels Bargo's age should have spared his life. He was 18 at the time of the murder, but the judge didn't see it that way, and he agreed with the jurors that Michael Bargo deserves to die. The defendant shall be taken by the proper authorities to the Florida State Prison and there be kept under close confinement until the date of his execution.